You're ready? So I want just to finish the material I was doing last time about uh, um, uh, plane cubics. So I've got C non-singular in P2C. And I fix the point O in C. And the statement is that uh, I get um, a group law on C with origin with origin O uh, defined defined as defined by this three points of intersection formula. So given uh, I do A, B, and then I go to this, this point here, which is called R, and then I do the same thing to get this point R bar, which is A plus B. OK, so it, it's, it looks sort of some kind of strange construction in geometry. So I take A, B to the line AB to the third point of intersection R of AB intersect the curve C. <coughs> and then and then I'm doing uh, R and O to the line O R and the third point R bar. <coughs> so I discussed uh, last time how to get uh, how to find to find um, uh, the inverse of P. So uh, I this is I already done I already did this, and that involves uh, you know constructing this funny third point O bar. So so I'm not going to do that again. Let me let me go to the to the main point, which is the main difficult point. So the the, the difficult point. is that this is associative. So in other words, if I do A plus B plus C, I get the same thing as A plus B plus C. Okay, so this is one of the axioms for a group. I say I've got a group law, so I'm supposed to prove this. I'm only going to give a partial proof here, so I'm going to uh, uh, so uh, you know sketch uh, you know a partial proof. I'm going to say what it is so the idea is the idea is this I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to say that uh, I construct the left hand side this is left hand side using four lines right so let's just think about this so for this purpose it's really convenient to not to draw the curve so let me just draw the points so here is a b and the third point here, which is R, so this is, so to speak, A star B. <clears throat> and then I'm doing this. I'm taking, as I said here, I'm doing R, O, and then I draw the line R, O, and I take the third point of intersections, uh, which is called, uh, which I'm going to call R bar. I'm following the notation in the book. 
because otherwise they go a bit crazy. So this is the point which is called a plus b. And then I've got, I've got a third point on the curve here, which I'm calling C. So I'm sorry, C is the point and it's also the curve, but you can live with that, I hope. <coughs> right. Right, and then I have to go back here to uh, S bar, wherever that is. So the four lines, I, I, I need, I need the, the four lines. I need especially the first three of the lines. So L1 intersect C is A, B, and R. Right, L2 is R, O, R bar. And L3 is R bar C, S. And then there's a, finally, when I'm not going to use this, L4 is S, O, S bar. And the S bar is, um, the final S bar is A plus B plus C. So now I'm going, to cons I'm going to just write down exactly the same thing for the right-hand side. So I'm not going to draw the picture anymore. I'm just going to say you know what, uh, uh, you know what it means. So for the right-hand side, uh, so the right-hand side is this. So the first thing to do is to construct B plus C. So I'm going to draw a line M1, which is B, C, and some third point of intersection. Right? And then I, can, then I have to invert, I have to reflect this guy in the origin as before. So this is Q, O, Q bar. M3 is, um, so I'm starting Q bar, the Q bar is the B plus C, right? So then I'm going to do Q, Q bar A and then some third point T. And then finally, uh, finally there'll be a, a fourth line, M4, which I'm not going to use, which is T, O, T bar, and the T bar is A plus B plus C. Okay, so um, I'm not doing anything here, I'm just writing out the definition. This is just, this is just how the lines are constructed. Okay, now I'm going to, when I say this is only a partial proof, I'm going to assume everything is general. So assume, uh, assume general. And that means that uh, all the points in the construction are distinct. Okay, so in other words, I'm not, I'm not really giving a rigorous, complete proof of this. I'm only proving it at the moment under this extra assumption. Okay, so now here's the, here's the so to speak, uh, clever, clever trick in the proof, at least. Uh, it looks clever uh, when you first see it. So I'm going to take, make two reducible cubics. Uh, so I'm going to uh, L1 plus M2 plus L3 and M1 plus L2 plus M3. Right? So I'm using, I'm using the first three lines and the first three lines of the two constructions and I'm just going alternately between them. Okay. So at some point I'm going to need a name for this and I don't know what the name in the book is. 
So this one is D1 and this one is D2. So if I do D1 intersect C, this is, well, it's A, B, R, Q, O, Q, bar, R, bar, C, S. So if you think about that, uh, I've got an O there. I've got an O from there. I've got A, B, C. So I'm getting A and B from there, and I'm getting C from uh, here. Right, and what else am I getting? Well, I'm getting R and R bar. Right, because I've got R here and R bar there. And, I, and I'm also getting Q and Q bar. Right? And what else am I getting? Well, I'm supposed to get, uh, you know, the, the, the rulers. We're, we're expecting to see nine points of intersection of, a cubic, of, of two cubics in the plane. <coughs> so uh, what else is there? There's also this point S. Right, so this is nine distinct points. So that, the nine distinct points is just by assumption. Right, so now let's do the same thing for D. D2 intersect C equals what? Well, you know, just, just you can check as I write them down, there's an O there, because D2 contains this line here, there's ABC there, there's R and R bar there, there's Q and Q bar, and finally there's T. So these two, these two different constructions, you know, they're using you know, some funny lines in the plane. If I drew them in the picture, you'd go crazy. You'd, uh, you'd, not, you'd not be able to see what's going on. But uh, uh, <coughs> there are, you know, there's some number of points here, duplications. Notice that the, the R bar is duplicated here. The R and the R bar are duplicated. But, that's, but I'm choosing uh, L1, M2, L3 here. So when I do that, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm no longer duplicating the elements. Instead, I'm covering them by Q and Q bar. So you know, what's the, uh, what do you notice about these? Well, they're more or less the same. They're, in fact, they're the same except for this final thing. So they're the same. So note, the same except for the final S and T. Yes? So I claim that S equals T. Right? So this follows from follows from a lemma I said yesterday and uh, I, the lemma I said last Thursday and that I'm going to repeat now. Okay, so if we, let's just believe this for the moment. So if we believe it, then uh, S bar equals T bar, because in the, in, the final, in the final construction, if I'm starting from the same point, I'm ending with the same point. And so therefore, the uh, associativity holds. Right. So, uh, so uh, as long as everything works right and S equals T, then I've proved that the construction on the left and the construction on the right give exactly the same point. Okay, so what's this lemma? So the two slightly different versions of the lemma, but let me, let me say it like this. Uh, if, uh, if 
what do I have? C1, C1, C2 cubics, and C1 intersects C2 equals nine distinct points. P1, P2, uh, P1, P8, P9. So this was a proposition or a lemma last time, I can't remember. Uh, right? Then the assertion is that if D is a cubic, a plane, another plane cubic, and D contains P1 up to P8, then also, also D contains P9. Okay, so in this case I apply this where, uh, you know, C1 and C2 are these two guys and D is this third guy. So I take, uh, so D1 and C, it doesn't, over here it doesn't say any, there's no need for the C's to be cube, uh, to be non-singular, they can be reducible. Right, so this one, uh, this one D1 is, is quite reducible, all of those points are collinear and so on, but uh, that doesn't matter. I do D1 in sec C, I get exactly nine, nine distinct points. And then I take this guy D2, and well, he passes through eight of the points, and therefore he must pass through the ninth point. And so, in fact, uh, he, must he must pass through the ninth point. So, although in theory, there's a, you know, when we write this down, there's a point T which is unknown, in fact, that point T coincides with S. <coughs> Okay, so uh, apply it with this uh, D1 in sec C. This is nine points. D2 contains nine, eight of them. Therefore, D2 contains T, uh, contains S. And therefore, S equals T. Okay. So that proves the associativity as long as I can justify this lemma. So, for, uh, so are we right? You, you're keeping up. <coughs> so, uh, so the lemma comes from <coughs> the lemma is more or less the same as the proposition. <coughs> if uh, P1 up to P8 are in P2. And I assume that no four are collinear and two, no seven are on a conic. Right? Then then this linear system S three of P one up to P8 is two-dimensional. Okay, so I could have written down S3 of P1 up to Pn uh, for some n, and uh, so this is uh, the space of cubic forms in X, Y, Z homogeneous cubic forms in X, Y, Z that vanish at P1 up to Pn. Okay, so cubic forms is this picture we've had several times, X cubed and so on up to Y cubed, uh, X squared Z and so on down to Z cubed. <coughs> Right, and we counted these before. There are 10 monomials here. So if there are no conditions here, cubic forms in X, Y, Z make a 10-dimensional vector space. <coughs> and then each time imposing these conditions here is each one of these is a linear 
conditions on the coefficients of, of, my, uh, of my cubic. And so uh, this dimension of this S3 of P1 up to Pn is certainly greater than or equal to 10 minus n. So those of you who were at the reading seminar this morning saw uh, uh, Sheng Chen talking about this in the case n equals 6 and for her it was important that this number is 4 and it follows by the same methods. <coughs> So somebody asked me last week, what is a linear system? Uh, well, it's, I sort of hesitate to say in general, uh, that'll come out later in the course, but in the projective plane, these forms of some degree form a vector space. We saw with conics, they form a six-dimensional vector space. With cubics, they form this ten-dimensional vector space. With quartics, they would be fifteen-dimensional, and so on and so forth. It's a, a binomial coefficient, which you can easily figure out. And so here, uh, a linear system is just a, a vector subspace of one of these guys. And the vector space has a dimension, and usually we're interested really in the projective dimension, so we usually subtract one. So these two, the, the statement uh, in, the, in, the, in the application where I apply this, I want to get a two-dimensional vector space of cubic forms. So a two-dimensional vector space of cubic form corresponds to a pencil of plane curves. Okay, so let me, so what, what, do, what do I want to say? So the proof of the proposition. So it really breaks into three cases. Uh, uh, you know, this is you know, it's, everything I'm saying is in the textbook, maybe not exactly in the same order. So three cases. A are three points of collinear. So one case is that when I write down my three point, my, my, seven, my eight points, three of them happen to be on a line. Case B is uh, six points are on a conic. So if I do this, uh, I have here's, uh, here there's some non-singular conic, and six of the points are like this. And then, uh, you know, the other, the other two points, well, of course they're on a straight line because any two points are on a straight line. Right, and C, neither of the above. So suppose by contradiction suppose by contradiction that this uh, linear system S3 of P1 up to P8 has, dimen has vector dimension uh, greater than or equal to 3. Okay. So let, let me just uh, let, let me just consider case C. Right. So here are here are two of my points. Right. And I've got this big linear system. So there's lots and lots of curves moving about in the plane. A big a big family of curves m m moving in a plane. And uh, uh, I I want to I want to break these curves. I want, to, uh, I want to break them up. Right? So, I, I've got the, so, there's, a, there's this family which is too big. So this is uh, vector dimension 3, vector space dimension 3. Right. So if I choose two more points, so let me call them Q1 and Q2, 
on the same line. So, so here's P1, P2, I don't care which. So choose two of the points, P1, P2, and two more points on the same line. Right, so Q1, Q2. So let's look at S3 of P1, P8. And then let's add to it Q1, Q2. So in other words, uh, uh, I, this is the guy, this is the vector space which is too big, which is a dimension at least one more. Right, and here I say, right, now, given that this one is already too big, I'm going to impose two more conditions. Right, so I have a three-dimensional vector space and then I impose two more linear conditions on it. So this guy here is not empty. So there exists a cubic, cubic form, cubic C3, with uh, C3, I uh, C3 intersect this line L is greater than or equal to four points. Right? So, you know, this is a... We've discussed this already. If I've got a cubic form and a line and the cubic form doesn't vanish entirely on the line, then it, can, it, it, it hits the line in at most three points. So we know, so we know that if, if C3 does not contain L, then C3 intersect L is less than or equal to three points. Okay? So therefore, C contains L. Right? And I'm not going to go into details. This is argued in some detail in the book that this implies that C is L uh, plus Q. Right, and uh, again, somebody asked me at the end of the last lecture what plus means in this context. So, um, uh, so you know, here's, a, here's the line which we forced the thing to contain, and then there's some Q here. L, Q. So the, the equation, this means the equation of C3 is divisible by the linear form dividing, uh, vanishing on L. It's divisible by the equation of L. Right, so C3 is L times Q. And I'm going to write plus here. Right, or you can think of this as being the same thing as L union Q. <coughs> But uh, just allow me, allow me to say, I'm going to take a line plus a conic, meaning, meaning union or meaning the reducible variety, which is the union of those two locuses. Right? Anyway, therefore, P3, P4 up to P8 are in Q. Right? So, so let me repeat the argument. I start off by saying that this, uh, that this linear system here is too big. Right? This linear system here is bigger than it's supposed to be. Given that, then I can make this construction. I can force two more points. Right? I can force this and I still get one non-zero element in this vector space which vanishes also at Q1, Q2. Then, you know, I've done... I've done you know, I've got a line here and a cubic that intersects the line in four points. So that's illegal, except for the possibility that the C3 actually contains the line. And that means that what I've done here is I've broken... There's one element in the linear system which breaks up as a union of two curves. Right? So it's L times Q, and then... So these are six points. Six points in Q. Right? And that contradicts the case assumption. This contradicts, contradicts C, right? 
And so, um, you know, in case A or B, there's a similar argument. And I'm just going to leave, leave you to read the similar argument in the book. So I think I'm going to leave this chapter of the book as it is. Um, as I said, the argument I'm giving here for associativity is really only, only is, is not really complete because I haven't allowed for the possibility that some of these points coincide. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, later, later in the course when I talk a little bit about divisors on curves and Riemann rock, I'll, um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give a, a slightly different proof here. So, so, you know, this is a really strange argument. And uh, another way of saying, so uh, this is just a final remark. Uh, in the proof of associativity, I have, uh, I have these lines, I have, these, uh, I have this uh, L1 plus M2 plus L3 and L, uh, M1 plus L2 plus M3. So uh, take the corresponding linear form. in x, y, z. Right? And write, inste instead of writing, so I'm going to write, uh, so L1 equals the equation defined by, uh, so, sorry, the line, line defined by the linear form L1. I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I just don't want to invent new notation for the same thing. Right, so it's a line in the plane, and at the same time, it's the equation of the line. Right, so now let's write down L1 times M2 times L3 divided by M1 times L2 times M2, M, uh, M3. Right, this is, this is a rational function of... Uh, X, Y, Z. So here's my P2, and it's homogeneous of degree zero. So here's my P2, here's my curve in it. And this thing here, I can write this as F. This F is a function on P2. It's a function on P2 having zeros along the three lines L, L1, M2, L3 and having poles along the three lines M1, L2, M3. So when I restrict it down to the curve, none of these lines contain the curve. So when I restrict it down to the curve, I get a rational function on the curve. Right? And the rational function on the curve has all of those guys as zeros and all of those guys as poles. So we just cancel them out. So this has, uh, eventually this thing has, uh, div uh, has um, uh, zeros, has a zero at S and a pole at T. Yes? So on a curve which is on a curve which is not a rational curve, remember I proved that the curve C is not rational, doesn't have any rational parameterization, this is impossible. This means that S equals T and the function is constant. 
Okay, and so, uh, you know, there's a, I've given this argument here involving this sort of slightly, uh, you know, strange construction involving lots and lots of different lines in the plane. Uh, and, uh, but in fact, you can think of this also as being uh, a part of the background to the riemann roch theorem. So here's a non-singular curve. On it, I've got a function. The function is defined in this funny way, but, uh, uh, you know, it, the function has one zero and one pole. And that's impossible on a curve of uh, a genus, uh, genus but not, not equal to zero. And it's impossible on a curve which is not rational. Okay, so I'm going to move to another... Uh, have I... I started at two. Okay. I'm going to move to another topic now, uh, which is not in UAG. So not in So this is extra material on uh, material on uh, I want to talk about the uh, Grassmannian varieties. G. Grassmannian R. M. And I really want to, uh, I really want to think mainly R equals 2 and mainly uh, N equals 4 or 5. But anyway, we can, uh, we can, I can start doing it generally. I want, just want to restrict to some sensible small case. Uh, so that it's possible to explain it rather simply. Okay, so why Grassmannians and why, uh, why do I want to explain this here? So, uh, so one, uh, this is motivation for projective space. Uh, let, me, let me write PN. So, uh, two weeks ago, when I started this lecture course, I gave you some reasons why you should be interested in PN, and also some reasons why PN is, is slightly difficult to study at the beginning. And so, this is more of, more of the same. And then, this is a homogeneous space. I'll explain what this is in a, in a while. Homogeneous space under a big group action. So under, under the group uh, GLN, same N. <coughs> uh, so this has applications, uh, e.g. in representation, for example, and uh, e.g. in representation theory. Right, and also I hope I can make it not too, not very difficult. Okay, so anyway, those are reasons why we want to study it. So what is it we're studying? <coughs> so remember the definition of projective space. Projective space Pn. Let, let me write Pn minus 1. So this is, uh, you know, all of this business about, uh, uh, you know, x naught up to x n in R in k n, and then divided out by minus zero, and then divided out by an equivalence relation, and then the next line was saying that this is the same thing as vector one-dimensional vector spaces. subspace in <coughs> Kn or in V. <coughs> so in other words, if I start with a, vector, a finite dimensional vector space over a field, so I'm working over a field K, which for the moment can be arbitrary, and later, later K will be C. 
mostly. <clears throat> so I start off with a vector space over, over, the, over the field K. I make an n-dimensional vector space, and then I make this construction. And uh, you know, the construction is the set of one-dimensional vector subspaces in there. <clears throat> so uh, cor corresponding to this, Grassmannian Rn is the set of R-dimensional. It's exactly the same. It's a set of R-dimensional vector subspaces. in kn equals v. Right. So, so we, can, we can also write Grassmannian of R in v <coughs> uh, <coughs> if we don't want to. <coughs> so, you know, the, uh, an issue throughout uh, this kind of... <coughs> so we've got a big group of symmetries here. <coughs> As you remember from linear algebra, if I've got one basis of a vector space and another basis of a vector space, then <clears throat> you can transform one basis to another exactly by an element of GLN. So GLN is, so to speak, the set of bases of a vector space. If I choose one basis, it's the, uh, it's the ambiguity in the choice of a basis. And so a lot of the time, we really want to do our mathematics intrinsically, in other words, we're going to use a basis when we need to calculate something, but the basis is not really part of the story. So we'd like to, do, we'd like to make constructions on V that don't depend on the choice of a basis. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's part of the story. So what do I want to know? What do I want to know about this? So uh, I'm going to prove the following things. This is an algebraic variety. of dimension r times n minus r. It's covered by affine pieces and the affine pieces look like matrix r times n minus r. Right, matrix, so let's say with values in K. So, so, so this thing here is, uh, you know, um, I don't know, A1R plus 1 up to A1N, ARR plus 1 up to ARN. Right with the AIs in K. Thank you. <coughs> right, what else, what else do I want to say? Um, mm, it, has an uh, it has an embedding. Embeds into projective n-dimensional space where n is uh, n choose r, this is the binomial coefficient n choose r minus 1. Right? And uh, its equations there, its equations in Pn are uh, quadrics. So this embedding is called the Plücker embedding. And these are called the Plücker equations. Okay, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll try to explain all these points. And then uh, it's especially nice in these, in these two cases, if r is 2 and n is 4, or if r is 2 and n is 5. <coughs> So 
So, uh, you know, if you ask the question, why do people study algebraic geometry, then, you know, there are, a number, uh, there are many, many different answers, and you can ask all the different specialists and they'll, t they'll give you different answers. But one of the reasons is because absolutely everywhere in mathematics you find spaces that are homogeneous spaces under a group and uh, that you need to study. You need to study for reasons, you know, for almost any number of reasons, for numbers of reasons of, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, representation theory or physics or number theory or anything. So these are going to appear every, everywhere. So I'm talking about uh, a variety here. This is, uh, you know, used ev everywhere in mathematics. Wouldn't surprise me if there are applications in engineering. So uh, I think possibly uh, I mentioned, I, 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 uh, when I started this two weeks ago, I started talking about projective space and how, uh, how we can uh, set xi equals 1 to get a slice of the equivalence relation. Right, so the, the, uh, the, you know, the tricky, the unpleasant thing about projective space, the thing that's difficult for <coughs> until you get really used to it, is that there is an equivalence relation here. So, you know, you don't automatically get any functions on the space at all. The, uh, the thing that's defined here is the ratio of these xi's, the ratio of the xi's, and, uh, you know, one of the xi's is not zero, so you could take that as the basis of all ratios and just, uh, so then it will be x1 over xi, and so on, 1, and so on. Right, and then this would be uh, k n minus 1. So in other words, when I, when I introduce projective space, it's a set so it's a quotient of this set by this equivalence relation. And then, if you want to do geometry in it, you want to know that locally you can parametrize it. You can find n minus 1 of these of the, uh, functions on the space, which are parameters. So we want to do the same for the Grassmannian. So for the Grassmannian, so a point of the Grassmannian. is E in V, right? So this is, the V is, uh, you know, you can, you can say it's explicitly Kn if you want, or you can say it's just a, or an n-dimensional vector space over K. So, you know, depending on what mood you're in, you might want to take a basis and say it's Kn, or you might prefer just think of it as an n-dimensional vector space. <clears throat> uh, however, how on earth are we going to put coordinates? So how to, how to uh, put coordinates on E? So uh, over there, when we're doing projective space, I've got a one-dimensional vector subspace, and that means I choose an element in it, so I have, to, I have to choose an element under the equivalence relation, I have to actually make a choice of the representative and equivalence class, and then I say, right, from now on, I'm going to be using this vector as the basis for my one-dimensional vector subspace. Right, so the answer here is, uh, uh, we'll start with a basis for E. Right, so it's a theorem of linear algebra that if I've got a, uh, if I've got a, uh, a vector space and a vector subspace, then I can choose E1, E2, up to E, 
R, and then E R plus one up to E N. Basis of V with uh, the first guys, the basis of of E. Yes, and uh, sometimes it might be convenient sometimes to think of this as uh, uh, base uh, F is K N minus R. Right? And so, in other words, given if, I, if I've got a particular E and I want to say, well, I'm going to choose the basis of it. Right, so then E, then, uh, so then V is E plus F. Or, or you might prefer to think of this as E in V mapping down to quotient F, which is V over E. Comes to the same thing, but uh, uh, this, is, this, this second point of view is going to be the more useful one. Okay, so suppose, suppose V is Kn with that basis, and E is uh, the subspace E1 up to E R. So then you write, then we write, then we write, uh, we can write E is uh, equal to, and then here I'm going to write 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and then zero. Whoops. Uh, so E together with its basis. So the thing I'm writing down here is the vector one, zero, and zero, and then the vector zero, one, zero, zero, and so on, and so on. So this is E1, E2 to ER as a basis of E. So that's very simple. How can I, uh, so let's just try and understand what this is. This is the R times R identity matrix. And this, this one here is R times N minus R zero matrix. Yes. So uh, how can I, I want to, uh, now I want to move E around. I want to m move E around in the set of all of these things. And the obvious way to do it is to, uh, is to say, well, let's just for the moment stick with this front bit. Let's, let's keep this and let's just allow this matrix to be filled up with any anything. 1, 0, 0, still the identity matrix. And here I write, instead of writing the 0 matrix, I'm going to write A, R plus 1, so A, 1, R plus 1, A, 1, N, and then a R, R plus 1, A, R, N. Right? So the thing that's there is an R times N minus R matrix with, in, uh, with, val with entries in K. So what have we done? You can think of those EIs being, those, 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 uh, these e A's being very small. Uh, so, so let me draw this picture. So here is, here is uh, E and here is F 
and I'm taking the whole space, the, the, this is the whole big vector space. Right? So every point in the vector space is uniquely written as a point of E plus a point of F. Right? So, uh, you know, maybe it's clear if one of them is one dimensional, for example, the other is two dimensional. The, the, this is the picture I'm writing. Here's the E and here's the F. Okay, and so what am I doing here? Well, I'm moving this around to E prime. Right, and what's a special feature that all of these E primes have? So, so every Every such E primed is uh, an, uh, a, a point, is a basis of an R dimensional, R -dimensional subspace. Right? So, so think of this, think of these, the lines of this matrix here as being R vectors in space, R vectors in N space. Then I say the vectors are linearly independent. Why are they linearly independent? Because already this front block here is non-singular. Right? Well, I've got one R by R block which is non-singular and therefore the matrix has rank R. And it already has maximum rank just because of its first block. So, in other words, this, uh, the rank of that matrix E primed is R. So, in this picture, we can say, so suppose I take, I sp suppose I take these vectors, and then I add in these vectors here, R plus 1 up to En. Right? So, if I add... Uh, e uh, R plus 1 up to En. So, so I've, I've got, uh, here's my matrix E prime is identity and then uh, various stuff here. And now here I'm going to write 0, 1, 0, 0. I'm going to write the identity matrix here. Right, then I don't, I don't know if it's sort of obvious to everybody, but uh, this, uh, um, by doing this, I get a basis of, I get a basis of the whole of V. So in other words, the, uh, the R vectors base, uh, basing E primed plus the uh, N minus R vectors E R plus 1 the N form a basis of V. Right. In other words, the guys E primed I'm writing down here are complementary to F. So I, so I started off with V is E plus F and I have found, I have found all E primed such that V is E primed plus F. Right? So in other words, E primed is complementary. To F. Okay, I hope I hope this is I hope this is clear. Uh, <clears throat> So, so this, uh, this result here, or this, this, uh, this proof here, and this result, this is uh, you know, something you learn sometime in the middle of your first year of linear algebra. Given a vector space, a subspace, all of this is finite dimensional. Given a finite dimensional vector space and a subspace, <coughs> then I can find a complementary subspace. And the way, the way you prove it is I choose a basis here 
by doing this. First I choose the basis of the first bit, then I choose the basis of the second bit, and then I forget the first bit. That gives the f which is complementary. Right? So here's, here's a, a way of writing numbers, a, a way of writing uh, uh, coordinates for the abstract notion of a vector subspace. Right? So I've chosen this one element, E. So this is like choosing the origin of coordinates. Right? This, this one is the, is the basic one that I want to start with. Right? And then here are all the guys that are near it. So this is a little coordinate neighborhood, a little affine piece, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, kr n minus r, depending on this number of coordinates. And th these are really a matrix. They're really the entries of a of an R by N minus R matrix. <clears throat> right? And so this allows me to write down lots and lots of these subspaces. This was just one, and these are all of its neighbors, and they're parameterized by this R times N minus R subspace. And the, the picture is these are all, this, the, the things that I'm writing down here parameterized by this is the set of all R-dimensional linear subspaces that are still complementary to F. Okay, so now let's, uh, now let's try and do this uh, uh, in general. And uh, so, so in coordinates, in coordinates, if uh, E is in V, K N, then E E has a basis. Uh, let's say F one up to F R. Right, and I, I don't want to use the same notation again. But uh, the where F one where F one is um, you know B one one. B one two to B one N and so on down to F R B one R B one N. Right, so I can arrange these as a matrix if I want to. I can arrange as an R times uh, as an R times N matrix. Right, so this is F1, F1 down to FR. The FIs are just the, uh, the rows of the matrix. So this is B11 down to BRN. Okay, so uh, I'm writing down this, uh, these vectors. What I'm thinking of is these vectors, F1 up to FR, are a basis of this space E. So how do I tell? How do I tell from that matrix that these guys base an R-dimensional subspace rather than the smaller one? Right, so this is again something you learnt in uh, first year linear algebra. What's the condition for, what's the condition for these, these uh, vectors? to base an R-dimensional subspace rather than the smaller one. So, so you know, let me, let me, let me do two times, let, let, let me do Grassmannian 2, comma, N, because it's completely representative and it's much simpler to write. So here I've got A1, A2, up to AN, B1, B2, up to BN. Right. So when do those two rows span a two-dimensional vector space? Any offers? 
Come on, you learn this in first year, then you're out of it. Right, right, right. When they're linearly independent. Right, linearly independent. So for two vectors, that means this one's not zero and this one's not a multiple of that one. Right. So either I linearly independent. So, so we insist that these be linearly independent. So that's the same in, uh, in Pn. If you, Pn minus 1, if you remember, I had x0, x1 up to xn, and I was insisting that xi is not 0 for some i. Right? So I want these to be linearly independent. So how do we, how do we test that in calculation? Sorry? You can, yeah, yeah, you want to multiply one row of the other to the other. Uh, I want to get a slightly, I want to go before that. So look, um, uh, when you do linear algebra, it, actually the people who teach linear algebra are always algebraists, and they're always... Uh, and they're always um, you know, embarrassed because they don't want to do things in coordinates. They don't want to do things in explicit coordinates. They always want to do things intrinsically. And uh, saying determinant is hard to do intrinsically. Right? So we assume, let's assume we know what determinant is. So we know determinant. Uh, two by two a determinant taken from here is called a minor, right? Uh, <coughs> Japanese shogyorets, sh I'm sure it's the same in Korean. <coughs> yeah? So what, do we, what are we going to do? If I want to test that this ve these two vectors are not linearly independent, So, so look, I write down 1, 2, 3, and then I write down 2, 4, 7. Are those two linearly independent? Obviously, yes. Why? Uh, as you say, Gaussian elimination. I could subtract, uh, do, do the second row minus twice the first row, and I get 0, 0, 1, so it's linearly independent. Right. An equivalent thing, I can calculate the 2 by 2 minor there. 14 minus 12 is not 0, and therefore they're linearly independent. Yeah? Better still, that one. <coughs> yeah. So linearly independent. This means that some 2 by 2 minor is not, not, not 0. Some, so 2 by 2 here, some r by r minor. Some r by r minor is not zero. Okay? So, um, so, so, you know, what, uh, if you think, what does this, what does this thing mean? So, so, exactly as you said, if you've got, uh, if I've got a matrix, I can, I can do this process of Row, row operations. So normally, normally you do row and column operations, but here we're only doing row operations. So I decide, for example, you know, if I had some mess here, I could subtract off one row from the other, subtract off a multiple of the first row from the second to, to make this zero. Right? I get these zeros here, if they were start off by, by being some mess, I get them by subtracting multiples of the first row to get zeros down there. Right? So I'm doing row operations on the matrix, right? And if I'm lucky, if, if it so happens that this guy at the front is not the singular matrix, so in other words, if the first R by R minor is non-zero, then I can arrange for it to be diagonal. That's just, that's just, uh, 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 that's just a theory of elimination. So in other words, if it so happens that this guy here so if 
the, the, the minor m12 is not zero, then I can change coordinates in E to get a 1, 0, 0, 1, and then A3 primed up to AN primed, B3 primed up to BN primed. Right. And that's exactly the same as this process here in projective space. Right? Uh, if I've got a two-dimensional uh, vector subspace, if I've got a two-dimensional vector subspace, then if I want to express it in numbers, if I want to say, if I want to give coordinates to it, if I want to write it down in, in, in coordinates, then I have to write down a basis. I have to choose a basis. Right? The basis depends on uh, not just the subspace, but the choice of basis inside it. So there's a kind of, implicitly there's a kind of GL2 acting here, which are the row operations we were talking about. Right? But if we assume that the first minor is non-zero, then I can choose the first, with the first, uh, the first two by two block here to be this, in this basic form, and then the rest, the rest of the, the rest of these entries are coordinates for the, um, the subspace in, in, these, in, these, uh, uh, in these coordinates. Okay, so let me, let me continue this next time, uh, continue this uh, after four o'clock. I have a new uh, test sheet for, for you, and I'm going to collect the old homework. Is that all right? Has, who has done the homework? I hope you've written your name on it. Yes? It's only for the, the students doing it for credit. You're doing it for credit? Yeah. Yes, yes. Good. Good. Any more? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I hand out the... It's probably 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. the, new, the new test. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. 